have thought on this too. Did he withdraw his sight from her at that moment? Where were all the powers he bestowed upon her? This question has come to me many times, and I have no answer. Perhaps there was no way for Andraste to return to the Maker but through her death. We will never know for sure. What do you wish of me? If you must. I was not born such. Tis a skill of Flemeth's, taught over many years in the wilds. The chastened have tales of we witches, saying that we assume the forms of creatures to watch them from hiding. When a child is alone and separate from his tribe, that is when we strike, dragging the young boy kicking and screaming to our lair to be devoured. A most amusing legend. Oh, I truly doubt that children would be worth the effort. They are filthy, smelly things full of tears and snot and trouble. That said, I cannot speak for the tastes of my mother. She has, after all, lived a very lengthy time in the wilds and done many things I know nothing of. Why do you ask? Is there something specific you wish to know? The form of an animal is different from my own. One may study the creature, learn to move as it does, think as it does. In time, this allows one to become as it is. I gain nothing by studying another human. I already am the same as they are. I learn nothing. So the answer is no, my human form is the only one I possess. There were nights when the wilds called to me, it is true. You look upon the world around you and you think you know it well. I have smelled it as a wolf, listened as a cat, prowled shadows that you never dreamed existed. But my life is as a human, I am under no illusions to the contrary. Sorry, it's my dog barking. They do not shy away from me. To their senses, I believe I seem like any other of their species. As to what they think, I truly cannot say. Just as I am still human, no matter my form, they are still animals. Thus, they cannot speak, even were I to ask. Anyone with sufficient will. But the act of transformation is a magical one. Tis a spell, and thus requires a mage's talents. Indeed, you could learn the spells required, if I cared to teach you. No? Tis not unheard of in the remote corners of the world. There are traditions of magic outside of the circle of magi, despite what those mages would have you believe. Some of these traditions are old, indeed, passed down as carefully guarded law from one generation to the next. The zealots of the Chantry would uproot all such practitioners if they could. But as luck have it, some still exist. My mother is such a one. Not all apostates use the forbidden blood arts. Maleficarum do, but to condemn all who do not fall under the circle's thrall for the sake of what might be is a dangerous path to walk. There are those who look on the word apostate as meaning freedom. Indeed. Have you an opinion on my abilities, then? Am I an unnatural abomination to be put to the torch? I wouldn't advise it. But enough of such talk, let us proceed lest the dust gather on us. What do you wish of me? If you must. By others, do you mean yourself? Then I shall teach you what I can whenever we are in camp, provided you have the will to yeah, make the attempt, that is. 
What do you wish of me? If you must. Why do you ask me such questions? I do not probe you for pointless information, do I? Beg pardon, then, while I jump for joy. What is it you asked if I grew up in the wilds? A curious question. Where else would you picture me? For many years it was simply Flemeth and I. The wilds and its creatures were more real to me than Flemeth's tales of the world of man. In time, I grew curious. I left the wilds to explore what lay beyond, never for long. Brief forays into a civilized wilderness. Would you not do the same? Your world is an unforgiving and cold place. The wilds I hail from is home to me and I a natural denizen. For all that I had been taught, however, the truth of the civilized lands proved to be overwhelming. I was unfamiliar with so much. So confident and bold was I, yet there was much that Flemeth could never have prepared me for. <laughs> Equal parts daring and foolhardy, perhaps. Only once was I accused of being a witch of the wilds, and that by a chastened who happened to be traveling with a merchant caravan. He pointed and gasped and began shouting in his strange language, and most assumed he was casting some curse upon me. I acted the terrified girl, and naturally, he was arrested. Men are always willing to believe two things about a woman. One, that she is weak, and two, that she finds him attractive. I played the weakling and battered my eyelashes at the captain of the guard. <laughs> Child's play. The point being that I was able to move through human lands fairly easily. Whatever humans think a witch of the wild looks like, tis not I. Not that I did not have trouble. There are things about human society which have always puzzled me, such as the touching. Why all the touching for a simple greeting? To begin with, yes. What is the point of touching my hand? I find it an offensive intrusion. There were many nuances that Flemeth could never tell me of. When to look into another's eyes. How to eat at a table. How to bargain without offending. None of these things I knew. I still do not understand it all, truth be told, but then I gave up long ago any hope of doing so. When I returned to the wilds last, I swore to Flemeth that I had no intention of leaving again. Yes? Let's ignore the entire Darkspawn threat and the presence of a simpleton as your only other Grey Warden ally, then. Not that I lack appreciation for the intent of your comment. Thank you. Well, let's get on with it before the ground opens up and swallows us, yes? Yes? At times, perhaps. A world full of people and buildings and things was all very foreign to me. If I wished companionship, I ran with the wolves and flew with the birds. If I spoke, it was to the trees. Don't be foolish. I recall the first time I crept beyond the edge of the wilds. I did so in animal form, remaining in the shadows and watching these strange townsfolk from afar. I happened upon a noblewoman by her carriage, adorned in sparkling garments the likes of which I had never before seen. I was dazzled. This, to me, seemed what true wealth and beauty must be. I snuck up behind her and stole a hand mirror from the carriage. It was encrusted in gold and crystalline gemstones, and I hugged it to my chest with delight as I sped back to the wilds. She was not. Flemeth was furious with me. I was a child and had not yet come into my full power, and I had risked discovery for the sake of a pretty bauble. To teach me a lesson, Flemeth took the mirror and smashed it upon the ground. I was heartbroken. That is because I learned my lesson well. Beauty and love are fleeting and have no meaning. Survival has meaning. Power has meaning. Without those lessons, I would not be here today, as difficult as they might have been. They did indeed. To return to your original question, perhaps my time in the wilds was indeed lonely, but such was how it had to be. 
I find myself at times wondering what might have become of the girl with the beautiful golden mirror, but such fantasies have no place amidst reality. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are very cute to ask so many questions. Really? Perhaps we should be wrapped in ribbons and adorned with flowers. So cute are we, too. <laughs> My mother has been haunted from time to time, yes. By Templar fools like Alistair, which should tell you how successful they generally were. Flemeth made a bit of a game of it, in fact. The Templars would come again, and she would look at me and smile and say that the fun was to begin once more. I am unsure. I was too young to understand, and perhaps it was bravado on Flemeth's part, or perhaps she was merely amused. I will never know. Flemeth would warn them once. It was a warning they inevitably failed to heed. And then the true game began. Often Flemeth would use me as bait, <laughs> a little girl to scream and run and lure the Templars deeper into the wilds and to their doom. It was a game, and I, a young girl. If I didn't get to play, I would have been very upset. Thankfully, the wilds is a vast place. Once they found us, Flemeth would simply move us elsewhere, and we would be lost within the forest once again. I did not understand the danger we faced until I was much older. I had never heard of apostates or maleficarum. You do not know. The Zealots use that word for any magic they do not control. The Chantry sees any mages not leashed to the Circle of Magi as apostates. And apostates could become Maleficarum, evil mages that resort to blood magic and become demon-enslaved abominations. It may even be true. Still, those of us who prefer freedom see no reason to submit. No? I am not surprised you say such. Enough of this talk. Let us return to the task at hand. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends, does it not? What does she seem to be? <laughs> Sometimes I do wonder the very same thing. Tell me, how much do you know of the tale? The one that the Chastened still tell of my mother, to frighten them into obedience. No doubt such a tale has mutated much over time and telling. I can relay what Flemeth once told me herself, and you can decide whether or not tis the truth, if you desire. As the tale is sung by the bards, there was a time when Flemeth was young and beautiful, a fair lass in a land of barbarian men, the desire of any who saw her. Many centuries before this land was even named Ferelden. The tales say that Flemeth fell in love with Osin the Bard and fled the castle of her husband, the dread Lord Conobar, and that he swore vengeance for her infidelity. In truth, my mother claims that t'was Osun who was her husband, and Conobar the jealous lord who looked on from afar. Lord Conobar approached young Osun and offered him wealth and power in exchange for his lovely wife, and Osun agreed. The life of a bard is a poor one, and love fades in the wake of hunger. It was Flemeth who suggested the arrangement. All would have been well had Lord Conobar kept his end of the bargain. But he was a foul man who bargained with coin he did not possess. Osun was led off to a field and slain, left for dead. Flemeth spoke to the spirits and learned of the deed, and swore revenge. Spirits first, and t'was they who slew Conobar. Flemeth did not turn to the demon until... 
much later. Lord Conobar's allies chased Flemeth, you see. Chased her to the wilds, and there she hid. There she found the demon, and he made her strong. The legends all speak of the great hero Cormac, he who defeated Flemeth and her great army when she invaded the lowlands centuries later. All lies. The truth of the matter is that there was never an invasion. As Flemeth tells it, the Chastened never raised an army under her banner, and she never fought with any warrior named Cormac. Cormac led a brutal civil war against his own people, and later claimed it was to vanquish evil that had taken root amongst the lords. Thus, he was hailed a hero. Flemeth was only attached to the legend much later. Perhaps it was due to the great war with the Chastened that eventually came, but Mother claims not to know how it began. I do not believe everything that Flemeth claims. Oft it seems her bitterness has colored her memories. But on the whole, yes, I believe this tale, if not all. The demon within her has transformed her into something else. An abomination, perhaps, some would say. I know not. I only know my mother is clever, and she is part of the wilds as it is part of her. But she is no immortal. She bleeds. A blade in her heart would kill her like any other, were it lucky enough to find her. You ask if I have sisters? I have asked of this myself. The stories tell of many witches of the wilds after all, not just the one. And these tales existed long before I did. Flemeth refuses to speak of other daughters, if they existed. So should I believe I am her first? I doubt that too. The Chastened tell of a falling out between Flemeth and her daughters. They say that one day she hunted them all through the wilds and ate their hearts. It may be true. I have never seen another witch or heard of one. Perhaps one day Flemeth will eat my heart as well. How often is this usually? Always? If not always, then when is it not true? There are more things in this world and the next than you or I could ever hope to understand. What Flemeth became is a mystery. I suspect even to her. Flemeth tells it with far more embellishment than I, but you are welcome. Dare I ask of your own mother? Few are abominations of legend, tis true, but I find myself curious nevertheless. I... nothing. I wish to know nothing more. I find myself a little envious, to tell the truth. But it matters not. Let us move on. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I assume you were actually asking whether Flemeth herself gave birth to me. Truly, I do not know. I once asked Flemeth that very question, and she merely laughed at me. It is not inconceivable that she could capture a chastened man, or perhaps change to a more attractive form to attract him willingly. I find it more difficult to imagine her with child. Who knows for certain? Flemeth is unique in her fashion, providing that the tales of her legend are as she claims. And she claims little. I do know the tales of Flemeth having many daughters, even though I have never met another. And Flemeth has always treated me as her blood. <laughs> what an odd thing to say! Why must love enter into the equation? Flemeth taught me everything I needed to learn. How to survive, the meaning of power, the truth of men. If other mothers do not teach these things, then I believe I them the lesser. Enough, so after I'm done having this conversation, then we'll get back on the road. No more cock talking, I promise. Room for coddling and weakness? Why should such things be desirable? Take yourself. 
You do not honestly desire such things from me, do you? Tis better to be free of such cloying and cluttering delusions as love. Then more the fool you, I think. I tire of this discussion. Let us move on, shall we? <laughs> 